So, like Linda, I would like to thank everyone for allowing me to be here and to participate in this conversation. Um, as Linda was speaking, I realized that a story with which I would like to begin my comments is an example of the politics of representation and of how, uh, in a particular context I will share with you, I started to question my own self-representation and to look at other ways of representing women. So the title of my comments is Gender, Femininity, and Equality, a Dialogue with Asian Feminist Theology. And, and as Linda was showing, I am defining feminist very broadly to include anyone, man or woman, who is um, committed to gender equality. Uh, as we go along, you'll also see that I include people who don't uh, identify clearly as either man or woman. So in the past several years, I've taught a course on theology and gender equality to pre-seminarians and women religious at a Catholic seminary in Bangalore, India. For me, this was a great introduction to cultural difference around the issue of gender. As a North American feminist, I have little patience with talk about gender complementarity, which I tend to see as simply a smokescreen for unequal treatment of women. However, my students, who were also supporters of greater equality for women in India, did not always share my views on gender language. This became quite clear in an amusing incident one day on the last day of class. My students presented me with a beautiful Indian kurta, which is a woman's shirt. They served refreshments, and one of them, a young priest who was one of the best students, made a short speech. He thanked me for the class, etc., on behalf of everyone present. Finally, he lifted out the highest praise of all, gratitude for my feminine genius. Even as he said it, he began to laugh, and so did I and the other students because they all knew perfectly well how I feel about feminine genius. <laughs> but the question I now have is whether in some social contexts, highlighting women's special characteristics can be a good and effective strategy toward gender equality. Does the view in Asia, for example, look different from the view in North America? Now, having posed the question in those terms, Asia versus North America, of course we need to qualify that by noting that Asia is very diverse, as many people have all already argued. Also in the United States, and Linda just gave some uh, examples, there are many different subcultures. So uh, neither in the case of North America nor Asia are we talking about just one thing, and particularly we need to be aware of what we call intersectionality, the way that race, gender, class, sexual orientation, gender identity uh, change one's particular viewpoint. But that being said, my question is about uh, male-female gender differentiation, etc., cetera, uh, and uh, different ways to that. And the basic perspective at which I have arrived is that gender is a relational concept, not something that really refers to inherent uh, characteristics of persons, particularly not ones that are biologically prescribed. Gender is a relational concept, and it's also a strategic political concept. In other words, concepts of gender are used to correct and rebalance gender roles, especially male-female roles, in a given social context. Gender frameworks are always advancing some normative vision of society in relation to specific other visions, which is exactly why gender frameworks are sometimes called gender ideologies. But advocacy for gender equality is not the only gender ideology, so is gender complementarity. 
Yet views of gender or gender frameworks are not just political or ideological inventions. They are based partly in concrete social realities and in realities of humans as embodied persons, whether they are male, female, or queer. Yet the ultimate question is not about whether there are inherent gender characteristics and what they are, but rather what are the social relations created by gender categories and are they respectful, just, and compassionate? Those terms also would need to be spelled out. I, as an ethicist, am very aware of that, but I'm not going to have time to do that now. Let us turn to three specific gender frameworks. I will call these inegalitarian gender complementarity, one, two, egalitarian gender difference, and three, egalitarian gender similarity. So just to repeat, the first one, inegalitarian gender complementarity, is a view of complementarity that specifically states that men and women do not have the same social roles and in fact allocates women to roles that involve less social power. The second free, uh, framework is egalitarian gender difference, where differences are recognized and even celebrated, but in the name of more equal social roles. And the final is egalitarian gender similarity, where equality is advocated and gender differences are downplayed. So first, number one, inegalitarian gender complementarity. The frameworks of male-female complementarity and feminine genius were made central to Catholic teaching by John Paul II. According to this model, it is only through the duality of the masculine and the feminine that the human finds full realization. This model extols the femininity and motherhood of all women, even celibate women, stating that all women have a maternal personality. But critics argue that the gender complementarity framework enables patriarchy and the subordination of women by identifying women primarily with their biologically based sexual and reproductive roles. Moreover, the Christian ideals of compassion, service, sacrifice, and as John Paul II put it, seeing persons with our hearts, especially the poor and vulnerable, are Christ-like qualities, not feminine. Therefore, let us move to a second model, egalitarian gender difference. Here, women's special characteristics and even their feminine genius provide reasons not only to value women, but to advocate for improved status of women in society and the church. For example, from India, Astrid Lobo Gajiwala argues for women's ordination to the priesthood by invoking women's menstrual blood, wounds, and capacity to nurture bodily life as images of women's connection and power. The U.S. feminist Elizabeth Johnson uses these same physical attributes of women to argue for female images of God as mother. Jean Caracolo of the Philippines reflects that the image of God as mother of the universe resonates in the deepest part of women's beings because it highlights the passionate love that they have glimpsed and experienced in motherhood. So maternal characteristics do speak to many women's actual experiences and can be a great source of consolation, strength, and connection for women, and perhaps a basis of social equality. In the third model, egalitarian gender similarity, and this is the one out of which I most naturally come, although I'm open to correction. Sex differences necessary for reproduction are recognized, but any inherent gender differences between men and women are viewed with immense suspicion. In terms of social and vocational capacities, 
Women and men are essentially the same. There are two streams within this model, however. In stream A, sex does not equal gender, but it is partly to explain for gender characteristics. In stream B, gender is purely a social construct. In stream A, then, sex-based gender differences are not discounted, but they're minimized. In stream B, gender, and sometimes even the sex body itself, are regarded as thoroughly social constructions. Stream A is dominant, but it borrows from stream B. For stream A, then, it is true that there are some sex-related gender characteristics. For instance, research has indicated that males tend to be more aggressive, not universally so, but a tendency, and have greater visual-spatial ability. Females tend to have greater verbal ability and also more emotional intelligence. Gender characteristics of transgender and other queer people have not been studied carefully and may vary even more widely than in typical males and females. But in any event, sex-related gender characteristics are not universal traits. They are tendencies on the spectrum. They are pliable, not determined, and can be put to good or bad use. Just as men can be aggressive and dominating, women can use their emotional intelligence to be controlling and manipulative. Thinkers in stream A draw on social scientific studies of hegemonic masculinity and emphasized femininity to argue that rigid gender norms are not innate because they require constant social reinforcement. Hegemonic masculinity prescribes power, strength, independence, authority, risk-taking, and suppression of pain and emotions of vulnerability and distress, as exhibited, for example, by crying. Complicit masculinity refers to men who do not achieve the ideal, but gain prestige from supporting it. And subordinated masculinity refers to men who don't meet the ideal and therefore are marginalized. <coughs> the corresponding norm for women is called emphasized femininity. In this model, youth, sexual attractiveness to men, and reproductive fertility are normative. In terms of behaviors, the feminine woman should be deferential to men, quiet, soft-spoken, compliant, and non-assertive, self-sacrificing, nurturing, and absorbed in domestic life and child care. Even competent professional women are still subject to renegotiated forms of emphasized femininity. We cannot fully refuse feminine qualities, dress, or demeanor, or we will be perceived as aggressive and demanding, qualities that threaten heterosexual norms of attraction and the loss of approval by men. The Filipino theologian Aloysius Cartagenas describes how hegemonic masculinity socializes men in his society. Although Filipino women theologians, he says, resist stereotypes, masculinity is still reinforced by two institutions, the Barcada and the Catholic Seminary. A Barcada, as most of you probably know, is a male peer group, particularly of young men, where solidarity is created around male identity. For example, by initiation into sex, drinking, and gambling. This process, says Cartagena, is extended and strengthened in the seminary, which he calls a hub of homosocial activities. I would say that virtually every culture has similar institutions, including my own, I could name some, that form men to be real men. Now for stream B. In this view, gender is completely the result of socialization and in no way related to biological characteristics. Now, in my view, it is going too far to say that the body, or even gender, are completely
basically social instructions. But the philosopher Judith Butler is right that sex and gender are highly performative in the sense of being constituted by participation in patterns of behavior or roles that pre-exist the individual and frame self-identity and meaning. In an essay titled Queer Revisions of Christianity, the Mal Malaysian post-colonial theologian Sharon Bong quotes Butler as saying, gender ought not to be construed as a stable identity or locus of agency from which various acts follow. Rather, gender is an identity tenuously constituted in time through a stylized repetition of acts. Thus, it is incorrect to say or assume, as do some expressions of Catholic teaching and remarks of Pope Francis on transgender, I love Pope Francis, but not on this topic, that everyone is born with a clear, natural sex, male or female, and that a unitary gender identity is directly derived from the sex given at birth. The experience of transgender and intersex persons certainly contradicts this. So my proposal then is that we take the emphasis off women, specifically female bodies, and turn instead to specific instantiations of virtue and efficacy in women as embodied in particular women or um, traditional, historical, or fictional roles of women, and as recognized in specific social contexts to embody women's dignity and equality. The important thing is not to focus on whether women or men or transgender people have inherent gender characteristics simply as men, women, or transgender but rather we should examine the actual roles through which women or other genders rise to paradigmatic levels of human or Christian excellence. I draw a parallel here to Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenz's suggestion that the Bible's authority is more like a historical prototype than a timeless archetype that can settle the basic structure of all later forms of the church. A prototype is more like a bowl or vase from a potter's wheel than like a blueprint or mold. Later versions will be recognizably similar, but not exactly the same. Variations can occur and improvements can be made. There can be cross-cultural recognition, admiration, and learning from the prototypes that have originated in other contexts. In that spirit, I uh, was going to, and still am, going to end by mentioning the traditional Filipino figure of the Babai Lan, about whom I first heard from Agnes Pazal uh, in a lecture that she gave at Boston College uh, during the past academic year. And I've read an essay that she's written on the topic as well. I'm happy to say she will talk about the Babai Lan today uh, much more appropriately than I. Um, so a couple of the things that were striking to me, though, is how she uses the pre-colonial Filipino figure of the Babai Lan to convey power and beauty of the inner self and also of elderly women as courageous and wise. Now, in this image and in others that we might be able to come up with from really any culture, I could offer some from my own culture, it's always women who are admired, or it can be women that are held up and admired, but the meaning of woman, although still recognizably a woman, is represented in historical, cultural, and dynamic terms, in terms that can represent the agency and worldviews of different women. In fact, gender binaries are explicitly challenged by the image of the Babai Lan, since a few are even men. I did find one scholarly article proposing, in fact, that the Babai Lan models the recovery of queer and transgender indigenous identities. Mm -hmm. So on that note, I will conclude. Um, and maybe in the discussion, we can turn to the audience. I would love to hear uh, commentary and reactions and maybe other figures of women's excellence that can illustrate for us what the feminine is in a gender equal way, but one that also introduces 
is cultural pluralism. So thank you, and I give my.